Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today, we're getting even deeper into the physics of things, because last time we were talking about the nature of the core of the sun, we talked about how there was a temperature difference between the core and the surface, and a density difference, and a pressure difference. So that means that if we wish to understand exactly how stars work, and why they do what they do, we need to go from their properties that we can observe, such as their surface, somehow down into the center. And that's what we call stellar structure, or the structure of the stars on the inside, not just their appearance on the outside, because the inside is different than the outside. There are no sunspots on the inside of the sun, and because, well, they're Whatever they are, they're very different, and nobody's ever been inside the sun. But we can make computer models, and we use those computer models in order to understand what's going on. So what we do is we have to take the observed properties, such as the mass, which is m sub sun, luminosity, which is the luminosity sub sun, which is these little symbols, again, these targets with the dot in it, that are subscripts, indicate that we're talking about the sun with this particular variable. And we can look at the radius, r sub sun, and temperature, t sub sun. And there's also a Greek letter rho, which looks kind of like a tilted p sub sun. So again, when we talk about these kind of variables, and those that haven't seen this before, um, we, we take this is a value of the temperature for the sun. And sometimes we can use this as a proportionality constant. Let's say something's twice the temperature of the sun, or twice the luminosity. And we would just put a 2 in front of that, or maybe it's 10 times the mass. We'd say 10m sub sun, and that would be the mass of that object. But for the sun, it's just m sub sun, 1m sub sun. So the 1 is there. But what we want to do now is we want to take these global properties, such as temperature, mass, radius, and luminosity, and density, and correlate them to the structure inside the sun and see how it's arranged inside. All right. Before we really do that, though, we have to know how stars shine. And we need to know how, how, uh, how energy transports through them. Well, very simply, stars are shining. They're not really shining, because shine means kind of like reflection. So let's also use the word glow. Let's let glow emit light. Mostly they emit light because they are hot. They are thermal black body radiation. In fact, specifically, what we mean by a thermal black body is that the surface of the sun, this enormous, enormous thing that's a million times bigger than the Earth and is a surface to, surface area, well, I, I forget what the, it's 100 times 4, uh, four pi r squared, it may be over 50,000 or 100,000, somewhere between 50 and 100,000 times the area of the sun, has roughly the same temperature which is really, really interesting. So that the, therm the average temperature of the sun is very close from one side to the other. It doesn't matter where you pick it. And therefore, it's a thermal black body, meaning it's so dense that all the light gets bounced around and it becomes one temperature. Now, the heat from the star, the sun, comes out of the photosphere. So that's the luminosity. The luminosity is the rate at which it's losing energy to space in every direction. And therefore, if they're going to stay hot, they got to make up for that energy by producing energy somewhere deep in the core. Because remember, we determined the core temperature is 15 million degrees. Where does that temperature come from? Just from compression? Well, that's what the temperature, we didn't say it, it, the gravitational force made the temperature. We said if gravity is pushing down on it, that must be the temperature in order for it to balance. Now, it could be that gravity is providing that temperature, but then things would change because it's emitting light. But for now, let's eventually just say, what's the current state of affairs? And so the basics of thermodynamics, and thermodynamics is a series of laws and rules, but the most important one is that heat always flows from hotter regions to cooler regions. Now, it's a funny thing is, is that what does that mean about like a refrigerator in your kitchen? A refrigerator in your kitchen says, I want to force the heat that is trying to get into the refrigerator away from this box. And so it's a heat pump and pumps heat away by various uh, mechanical mechanisms and fluids that actually expand and contract under pressure, um, so or lack thereof. So, but heat always flows from hot to cold, and so you must provide work in order for that not to happen. So, stars, it's hot in the core, it flows out through the cooler regions above it, and eventually the surface that gets radiated away is light, or other stuff, but mostly light, and we care mostly about light here. So, 
Thermodynamics says that there is a flow of heat from into from the hot region of the core to the surface, which is much uh, which is much cooler. All right. So how does it get from the center to the outside? And that's called energy transport. And energy transport is simply the way we say there may there there are three ways in nature that that energy can be transported. The first is radiation. And so you have a bunch of photons. And photons might carry energy. In fact, they do. Every photon, as we learned in previous lectures, is a packet of energy, and its wavelength is proportional, it, its frequency is proportional to its energy. So you can make a photon by some process, and then the photon goes from there to here, and it is transferred that energy from there to here. And that is called radiation. By photons just go from there to here and carry energy. The next way is you can heat up a bubble of gas and move it because it's buoyant from one place to another, from a cool place to a hot, from a hot place to a cooler place. So if you get a bulk motion of gas, like a big cloud or a big bulk gas ball, it'll go from below to above. Finally, you can do conduction, and conduction is, you can't, it, it's not the, atoms vibrating against each other and as they vibrate against each other they they hit each other with the same temperature so if you have somebody vibrating one uh, right next to you you kind of get wiggly yourself and so basically conduction is the transfer of energy because somebody's wiggling right next to you and you can't not wiggle uh, unless with this person wiggling right next to you. Uh, on the subways I get out occasionally and there's people that are like really annoying and they jiggle in their seats and eventually I get up and leave. So I they conducted their energy to me and therefore I had to get the heck out of there. In any event, these are our three dominant ways, the three ways of transporting energy from some place that's hot to some place that's cool. Let's look at each of them. Um, but first, we're going to say that we, we, we can see that they play a part in every aspect. So if you have heat from a fire, that heat is, can be transferred by radiation because the gases glow, and the glowing gas then can radiate its infrared light to the pan above it that's being held above it. Then that conducts from the outside of the pan to the inside of the pan, heat is conducted by the motions of the, ma uh, the metal in the pan. And then that heats the water by conduction at the bottom of the pan. Then bubbles form at convective bubbles, meaning a, a, a bunch of, a, some of the water molecules at the bottom become hotter than their surrounding. And because they're hotter, they rise up and then they emit their energy at the surface where it's cooler and then sink. Or more specifically, they displace cooler stuff at the top, and then that forces the cooler stuff to the bottom because you just don't have big gaps in liquid fluids. So the three equations to the left dictate those things, and they all show a temperature gradient. That's what that dt dr means, a change in temperature as a change in radius or distance. And this is specifically for stars, so we're thinking a vertical distance. So uh, the as the temperature goes from, from, how does it vary from the in to the out? And these three equations show that. Radiation, uh, on the first one, the little uh, the kappa, the little k at the top, shows how, how light is absorbed or emitted. The rho and L are an indication of how far rho is the density, and L is how far the photon travels before it gets absorbed by the density of material. And the, kappa, the, the k, kappa, Greek letter kappa, shows how well it can absorb it. On the bottom, there's a surface area thing. Let's have that pi r squared thing. There's some number 64, the number three is just ruined. Those things come about as a result of yada, yada, yada. I'll just say that. Uh, but that shows a surface area through which the radiation must pass. And the sigma t to the fourth, that, that little sigma, which is like an O with a hat on it, sigma t to the fourth indicates the amount of energy that you get in a black body. So it's assuming that the radiation profile of a little bubble of gas, or wherever the light is traveling through, it's a thermal, it is the same signature as the material around it. So if it's transporting by radiation, then it has the, then the light, then the light has the same temperature profile as the material surrounding it. And so therefore it's all the same thing and it can bounce around quickly by radiation. Middle thing is adiabatic convection, meaning it stay, the energy does not flow into or out of the bubble. And so the temperature gradient it depends only on the pressure and as well as how well it can hang on to that 
uh, that heat, and that's what that gamma is at the left. So you have a pressure gradient, and the pressure gradient means dpdr, and, the, and there's a difference in temperature and pressure, which is the T over the P. If you, have a if you have a pressure gradient, and there's a temperature gradient inside of that pressure gradient, then you can get convection. Finally, conduction depends on how well the, the, the how, how close the atoms are to each other, how close they are, and how easy they are to, uh, if they're very, very tightly packed, then vibrations between atoms actually conduct energy more efficiently than the other two. So which one of these things are used is dependent upon the temperature, the pressure, and the density of the material in which you're, in which you're discussing. And so whichever has the steepest temperature gradient wins. And typically, and it depends on the material that you're talking about. All right, in radiation, it's a light is energy is carried away by photons coming from their heat source. Funny thing is, deep, 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 deep in a star, even though the density is greater than that of gold, ten times that of gold, the the temperature is so incredibly high that it still is efficient for it to transfer itself around by by radiation. But just because it's transferring around by radiation doesn't mean it's like, boom, I'm out from the center of the sun. No, it bounces around incredibly. In fact, it only goes about a, uh, it only goes about a centimeter before it hits another atom and goes in some random direction. And when you're at the bottom of the sun or the core of the sun, every way looks up because every way is up. And so you have a random walk uh, for this typical photon to go and interact from where it's emitted uh, in some reaction that creates it. And it bounces from atom, well, not atom, from nucleus to nucleus or electron to electron, scattering off of them, bouncing off of them, reflecting off of them, transferring its energy around. And eventually that photon, after almost a quarter million years, makes its way to the surface. And that's the, that is called a random walk or a drunken walk from the, from the center outward. Once it gets closer to the surface, though, it tends to, uh, it tends to be bounced around instead by radiation, but through conduction, through convection. And that's what we've seen at the surface of the sun. That's why I drew the arrow long toward the surface, but, but doing that random walk in the core. All right, so convection, though, again, is where you have a hot bubble that's close to a heat source, gets warm, becomes more buoyant than its surroundings, meaning if something more buoyant means less dense. And so if you have some fluid where the density can change, and then if it's less dense, it becomes more buoyant. It can then rise as a result because it is, it is, it overcomes the, it, it overcomes the pull due to gravity compared to compared to the bubbles around it. And so the bubbles rearrange themselves such the hotter bubble moves upward and the cooler bubbles move down. Eventually, the hotter bubble gets to a place where it can transfer its energy more efficiently, efficiently, say, by radiation, and then it cools off and then sinks. So convection sets up flows or boiling flows and roiling flows that, that mean that you have bubbles rising and bubbles falling. And we've seen that at the surface of the sun with the granulation and supergranulation. All right, and convection is also very easily seen in a boiling pot of water when you make spaghetti or ramen noodles. Conduction, though, is, is when heat is passed by vibrating atoms to atoms in a dense, some dense material. Now, the funny thing is, is that this takes time. Now, it's very strange because you think, well, why can't it just radiate the heat? Well, apparently, it's so dense, the materials are so dense, that light can't go very easily from point to point to point. And so since it can't go very easily because of the high density of the material, the material itself absorbs that energy that may have become emitted by light or transferred by light, and it starts to vibrate, move, and glow. Uh, and then it starts to glow very, like maybe an infrared, but then eventually the vibration of the mo each, each my atom or molecule or starts to vibrate against each other, and then that feeling of heat in your hand when you pick up a hot pot or something that's been next to a stove is because the the your hand is now getting vibrated or the atoms in your hand are being vibrated at the same rate as the vibrations of the handle of the hot pot and then you get a burn because you typically if it's very 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 hot then you get boiled water quickly inside of your hand and that damages your skin etc etc
So what you have to have is you have to have extraordinarily dense materials. And this does not really play into, come into play in typical stars because the, the, even though it's extremely more dense than steel at the center of the sun, the heat, the temperature is so incredibly high that the, that the atoms behave as a gas, not a solid. And so conduction typically happens in solids where there's a binding, where they're so packed together that electrons from one atom over are, are in contact or shared with electrons from, uh, from another atom, or electrons are shared among atoms. So how is energy transported in stars? In normal stars, it's a mix of radiation and convection. Uh, we've seen with the sun that it's convection at the surface, so I'm just going to say right now that it's mostly radiation at the center, and that's what it works out to be. And if you have and, and conduction, is not the way to go because the density of density where conduction happens is too low for the center of the star, which is fascinating. So conduction is kind of this funny thing where it has to be not too hot, not too hot, just right. It's kind of a solids thing. And stars are not solid, so you'll have radi radiation and convection. However, if we look at, say, white dwarf stars, which are extraordinarily dense, extraordinarily dense objects, then light can't get through very easily. And so it behaves as though it's a solid. And uh, then you have conduction that works. Anyway, so when you have stars roughly like the size of the sun, which is the middle diagram, you, uh, you have the center uh, radiation transport is how things go, but near the surface it's conduction. And very small stars, we haven't talked about the sizes of stars, but let's say the size of the star is say, very tiny or up to about half the mass of the sun, then it's convective all the way through. And we have much more massive stars, say more massive than say one and a half or two times the mass of the, star, the sun, then it's convective in the core and radiative in the envelope. Uh, and that happens because the density of these stars drops rapidly as in the outer regions, and the density in the center in the core is actually extraordinarily high. So we can see that the convective region changes with respect to stars. In short, we have thermal equilibrium in stars. And this is incredibly important to think about because thermal equilibrium means the heat that's coming from the center is and that is radiating the surface is replenished. So in thermal equilibrium, the, the surface of the star is not getting hotter or cooler. The core is in general not getting hotter or cooler. And so somehow there is an equilibrium of stuff. And you have a temperature profile like we saw in the previous one where it's hot in the center and cool in the outside. And that is in equilibrium so long as something is producing that heat in the core. So, the, and so therefore the generation, how much energy is generated by the star, is the star's luminosity. And the thermal equilibrium is a balance. So you can get more luminosity out of the star if you contract it. Because remember, if you, can, if you collapse a star, if you collapse a gas, it heats up. And if it heats up, it emits more energy. And if it emits more energy, then it'll expand. And if it expands, it'll push the star out a little bit. And so there's a natural thermostat to it all. And if, you, and if the star is, is, has expanded, then it will cool off and it will start to contract because gravity is always trying to pull on the star. It's really important to remember that this gravity thing is always pulling on stars, and that is ultimately the squeeze of nature. And as it squeezes it, that makes the star emit light in some way, and that forces the evolution of stars because stars must change because their luminosity means as that they're radiating away energy, so therefore something's got to be happening down in the core. In sum, Somehow energy is made in the core, there is a hydrostatic thermostat, meaning that as light and energy is passing from the core to the surface, and it's being transported either by radiative processes or convective processes, it goes from the core to the surface, and, uh, and the, then therefore you have this, this thermal equilibrium. And then the, there's hydrostatic equilibrium, which is different than thermal equilibrium. Hydrostatic equilibrium means that stuff is not moving uh, up or down. It's not contracting or expanding. And thermal equilibrium means there is a balance between the amount of energy being produced and the amount of energy being emitted.
So thermal equilibrium is energy production and emission. Hydrostatic equilibrium means nothing's moving up or down. And it comes into balance. And so the sun is in balance and it's been around for a very, very, very long time. But because of the fact that there's energy being emitted, the star must change. All right, so that's a summary of it. But now we're going to go do some extra bits really quick. And it's not that quick, but let's look at it anyway. So we looked originally at the hydrostatic equilibrium equation, which is a pressure gradient, or how the pressure changes with radius. And that depends on Newton's gravitational constant, the mass of the star, and the mass of the bubble that we're talking about inside the star, or the layer of the star and the density of that layer, and the radius from which it, from the center of that thing. And then we learned that with mass continuity, that there's some sort of mass element, and it's at a certain amount of stuff, and there's just no gaps in the stars. And then we can use radiative energy transport, we saw that before, and somehow energy is being produced in the center. So again, mass continuity says that there aren't any really big gaps. So if you went out into a star, if you somehow went, you would not find that all of a sudden, say, it's out 20,000 miles in, that there's like this huge open space where nothing's happening. No, there's always mass there, and it's not like it drops away to zero mass or something like that. There are no big gaps inside of stars. However, energy is being produced in the core and not above it. So there is, oop, I'm letting the cat out of the bag by saying it's nuclear fusion down in the core. And so this thing says, what is the luminosity or DL or where, how much luminosity is produced at which radius, DR, a little, little slice of radius from the center going out, how much luminosity is being contributed to the total amount DL um, at each at each little onion skin level radial of distance from the surface. And so those E's are Greek letter epsilon, E minus E sub mu, which is uh, which is energy produced by by neutrinos. But the energy that is being produced by the center of the star is E. And where is that E, that little E epsilon is how much energy is produced uh, in at that layer by some means. Now, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. It's by nuclear fusion. And we have different flavors of nuclear fusion that we'll talk about next time. And there's even more because pressure figures in, opacity, how easy it is for the light to get out from there to there. What is the thing that presents it? Every one of these things is a function of density and temperature and composition. So all of these equations are interrelated. And they're interrelated, maybe it was produced by the proton-proton chain or sinus cycle or triple alpha, but may, and opacity measures how easily light goes through the star. And, but pressure is important because that's the thing that relates them all together. And so we use the ideal gas law, which we talked about last time, in order to relate them. So with a combination of all of these equations together, and I added the adiabatic uh, convection equation in here too, we add all these equations together, plug them into a computer, and solve the equations simultaneously, looking for the surface features and try to see what we have at the surface. We determine some incredibly interesting things about stars. And so this set of equations here will tell us the nature of the sun inside by all these variables, temperature, density, uh, luminosity, uh, radius, mass, pressure, uh, the amount of energy produced in a certain little area, uh, the average mass of a particle, where it is there, how far a, a, a photon can travel before it scatters off of things. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing set of things, but it's interesting to note that we can take these six and maybe a couple more equations that will tell us everything about the star. It's really interesting. And some of the only inputs that we care about are what the luminosity of the surface is, the temperature at the surface, the radius of the star at the surface, and the mass of the star. And we plug all of those things in, and that tells us the internal structure of the star. So in a very real sense, it, it sounds pretty complicated, but actually it's, it's incredibly simple. And these things are much simpler than, say, trying to figure out what's going on inside of cells or DNA. DNA is an incredibly complex thing. Biolog biological processes are incredibly complex. But they cannot be broken down into these kind of simple equations with any degree of ease. But at least stars can be, and we can learn how stars work. And that's what we're going to be talking about next time. And so we'll see you soon.